Hey listeners, welcome to the Product Hunt Weekly Podcast. This is the podcast where we, your Product Hunt content team, break down the week's tech headlines, talk about products making waves on the leaderboard, and discuss the ones we love. This is our second podcast, so thank you for joining us, and thank you to everyone who shared their feedback on our first podcast. It goes a long way to making sure we can make this better week after week. By the way, I'm Sarah. I've been the content lead at Product Hunt for about two and a half years. And one of my favorite things is to wake up and look through the latest launches and the biggest tech news. And now I get to do that for the Weekly Digest podcast alongside my co-host, Aaron. And yeah, I'm Aaron. I tend to reside in your inbox if you read the Daily Digest. Uh, I'm a chef turned techie who has been at Product Hunt for around five years. And I'm based in Ireland. And you are joined by your uh, co-host today as well. Hey, yes. Two rowdy dogs um, trying to wrestle and going into every single room that I go into. <laughs> your mistake, Aaron, is not going with the standard product hunt mascot, the cat. Yeah, <laughs> I think about that a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, I have two cats here and they are good co-hosts. They're pretty much just sleeping somewhere. <laughs> So in today's episode, we are going to cover some interesting products from the past week, some new trends to be watching, and some news, including the highly anticipated Cybertruck launch. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, shall we move on to some of the products that we've been watching over the past few weeks? Yeah, let's do it. So this is a section where we talk about some products that really piqued our interest from the last week. These are products that were reaching the top of the leaderboard, or they introduce a new trend across tech, or they're products that the community just really loved. Aaron, do you want to kick us off? Sure. So you've probably heard of a garage sale or garage sale, however I pronounce it there. Uh, so last week, a new product launched called AI Garage Sale. It was launched by a small Los Angeles-based art studio called Brain, and it's pretty much Exactly what it sounds like. It's a totally fully operable digital garage sale managed by an AI with like a ton of personality whose sole motive is to get you to purchase actual items that you can ship to your house and pay actual money for. The items can range from anything from like a collection of pogs, which was a big trip down memory lane, to a personalized video from a Pawn Stars celeb, to even a pair of AirPods. Pretty much I spent like a not so insignificant amount of time haggling down the different AI personalities. Some are tougher than others, let me tell you. They can really play like hardball with, with their price. Some can go super low. Others won't even budge. Really roll of the dice here. I love this. I also remember Pogs. I had a few of those myself back in the day. And did you manage to snag any good deals? No, unfortunately not. I did really want those Pogs. It was like a... 200 of them for like $20 or something. But no, I didn't actually snag any deals. I would have, but it doesn't ship to Ireland, unfortunately. But I did spend like the better part of like three hours just recycling through all of them and coming up with different tactics to haggle uh, these different personalities down. At one point, I hang haggled down like a PS5 Slim from like 600 to 350. And I have to say one thing to actually help me with that was I covered this in la one of last week's newsletters and I mentioned that to the AI and the AI got like really excited and knocked a hundred off straight away. Wow. So I was pretty, I was pretty proud of that. Um, others then wouldn't even budge past the selling price. The one I wanted to get because it was an email one was the Pawn Star celeb and my dad's like this huge fan of Pawn Stars. So I actually wanted to get that personalized video but no, no matter what I got, it would not budge from the asking price on that one and um, so that was a bit of a bitter disappointment but uh yeah to this day i'm still messing around and testing my haggling skills with this just because it's so fun this is such a cool product i was taking a look at the website and the design is just super fun and bright i love the whole concept around it and then it's got such a range of products to haggle for do you know anything about the makers behind the product not much. They're, they're kind of like a mischief kind of style art studio. They make a bunch of different experiments throughout the year. All kind of techy kind of experiments, ones that make you kind of think, wow, you know, I didn't, I didn't really see this coming. And it really kind of took off with this one. It was like covers everywhere for like a day. I think it's partly as well because a lot of AI, AI's over usage of it kind of gets rid of the novelty of it until something that just 
is totally different that you didn't expect comes up like this one that's screaming with personality. But yeah, they're basically just a small art studio from LA that make these really fun, techy kind of experiments. Yeah, true. It's really refreshing to see something that's not like a chat bot and just has a lot of personality to it. It feels as much like a social experiment or an art project as it does an actual product, but at the same time, there's actual value to it. So that's what I love about this product. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. The personalities as well. as so many. Like one is like a boomer slash parent learning to use Facebook personality. So he like ty- types in all caps and signs off his name to every message. Uh, and that made me laugh. And then others <laughs> are like G- edgy Gen Zers um, and stuff. But yeah, oftentimes it felt like I was talking to an actual person. So. That's cool. Wait, is that the the bot that you're talking about had that sort of personality? Yeah, like, yes. They have, they have, I want to say around like 10 different personalities programmed into it. Like to, there's some that are like famous actors and everything. But my favorite one was like the boomer one. It's just this guy called George or something. And he just types everything in all caps and then just signs his name hyphen George uh, to every message he, said, he sends. I, I know at least 10 versions of this man in real life. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, I didn't quite get that, that there are personalities to the AI agent, which is yeah, awesome. Very highlights. <laughs> I'm going to check that out after and see see what I can haggle down. I love those stories about, you know, like um, someone haggled a, p- a paperclip and get, gets a house at the end. So uh, I'm going to go after those pogs <laughs> to start and see where I go. Yeah, yeah. Send me one of the pogs as a token, please, because I couldn't get them. Will do. (laughs) Cool. Well, my product highlight is also in AI because no one is talking about AI these days. You know, it's just really bad. (laughs) I just really feel like it could get some love and attention. Um, (laughs) But I wanted to talk about Floral. Uh, which launched a couple weeks ago on Product Hunt. Flow RL provides real-time UI personalization powered by AI. So in its simplest form, what I love about it is that you can imagine you and I, Aaron, are sitting next to each other looking at the same e-commerce site, but my shopping cart looks different than yours. And it's each is personalized to us and is more likely to get us to convert. And... I love that because it just gives you a picture of what's possible and what's coming in the spaces of marketing, advertising, e-commerce, and all of those things with AI. I think it's it's not a space we've really kind of dived into yet. So FlowRL uses a concept called reinforcement learning in AI, which makes it much more powerful than what we've been doing to date to test personalized UIs like A-B testing, for example. Mm-hmm. Reinforcement learning isn't new, but it was all new and news to me. Uh, Aaron, are you familiar with this concept? Uh, no, that was actually going to be my question to um, maybe delving a bit deeper into reinforcement learning. I know a lot of terms like machine learning and stuff like that, but I haven't heard this one. I have an idea what it might be just from the name of it, but uh, yeah, I'd love to hear more about it. Right. Yeah, same. I, I'm coming across new terms in AI all the time. And for people who are deep in this space, uh, they might be familiar with the concept already. But for people like me, I'm kind of constantly coming across new terms and really how they are growing and evolving in this space and learning constantly from, I guess, experts in this space. And so that's exactly what happened here. I went and spoke to the makers at FlowRL. Fred Kurdov and Alex Primachev. I probably butchered some last names, so apologies. But they explained to me some of the basics behind reinforcement learning. And then I went and did some research myself. So again, while this is all news to me, reinforcement learning isn't really new. It's a method that's already being used in AI in things like autonomous vehicles, video games, robotics, and even in GPT-4 and now ChatGPT. So reinforcement learning is a machine learning technique where an agent learns to make decisions by interacting with an environment. And the goal is to obtain the maximum cumulative reward. So through trial and error, an AI agent receives feedback in the form of rewards or penalties 
And then it learns and improves over time until, again, you get what would be the ultimate cumulative reward. And in some of these applications like GPT, for example, there's a specific method used called reinforcement learning from human feedback. So some of those rewards or penalties are created in combination with humans to help that AI agent learn what the ultimate reward would be. So this to me was super helpful to put everything in context. I don't know about you, but whenever OpenAI comes out with something new, I always can see and understand that it's better, but I don't totally exactly know why. And that yeah. was yeah, that was sort of what happened with GPT-4. I remember that OpenAI had launched it and they said it has more context. It basically is better at understanding and that all sounded really cool, but now I understand a little bit more as to why. So basically that latest version had incorporated reinforcement learning with human feedback, which helped give it more context. I did write up a, an article more about my interview with Fred and Alexi and what I learned about reinforcement learning. That actually reminded me of um, a, a few videos I used to watch maybe like a year and a half ago, because you mentioned gaming. There's this programmer, I can't remember his YouTube channel, but he basically tra trained this like Rocket League bot. And for anyone who doesn't know Rocket League, it's basically car soccer on PlayStation and Xbox. Uh, and he trained this bot using reinforcement learning, from what I can gather anyway, over like the course of like, a full week or something. And he never touched the controller really. And it went from being unable to even move to going to a pro level and beating some of like the best people in it. So yeah, that, yeah, that was really cool. And it's really cool that that's been applied to A-B testing. You and I working in content, we do a lot of A-B testing for subject lines and stuff like that. So thinking about like the potential for reinforcement learning with like subject lines and all that in the future, that sounds really cool to me. Exactly. Yeah, we, we really haven't seen this concept applied as much in the marketing or content space. Um, at least not at this level where makers are basically being given access to use this type of technology to then apply it to their products, mm -hmm. which is why I think FlowRL is so cool. So let me have Fred and Alexi explain this a bit themselves. So yeah, basically what we allow is plug and play UI personalization. So you might uh, envision different UI elements that might be in need for different users. So it might be banner on a home uh, screen page. It might be some rearrangement of components on a cart product page, etc. And what our algorithm does is predict which UI variant is best for a given particular user. So yeah, we use deep reinforcement learning with multi-binary uh, action space. So basically, it just chooses variants in each experiment given by a user. We also leverage transformers a bit. So we leverage clicks data and events data that our customers provide to us to make an embedding. So basically it's how like ChatGPT trained on token sequences where each token is a word. In our context, each token is event that happening inside an app. We basically compress this quote unquote text of events into tight representations called uh, embeddings. And those embeddings are what basically fed to the model for uh, each user. We have a separate embedding, of course, which help model to predict which UI variants to, to serve with objective to optimize given metric. So it might be subscriptions, it might be bookings, it might be orders and yeah, something like that. So that means there's flexibility on like whatever your event is as well, whatever your conversion might be. At the moment, that's defined entirely by the users of our platform. So they specify the exact event from their data structure that they would like to optimize for. But long term, we're actually targeting something more high level. So we want to target revenue and lifetime value because that's something that's like traditional methods like A-B testing and whatnot can't really achieve in the limited scope of, of a test. And with FlowRL, we, we kind of allow for that. And if you're wondering, is that really that different than A-B testing? Maybe you're already seeing or you're already using different UIs and you're testing them all the time. I had the same question. I asked that to Fred and Alexi and their answer was essentially that 
reinforcement learning is sort of the best opportunity for personalization um, in real time. So they said there are several comparison points against A-B testing, but the first and biggest is that with reinforcement learning, the results aren't arbitrary in A-B testing. You're arbitrarily giving them different variants, and then you're picking a winner based on averages. Reinforcement learning doesn't do that. They start serving randomly to users, and then the AI agent starts to target specific individual users who would benefit from the specific variants. Um, and in A-B testing, you get a winning variant and you had 60% of users who preferred it. But there were still 40% of people who didn't prefer it. However, you're going to roll out the winning variant to everybody. So that's not really preferable for everybody for that 40% of users because there are still 40% that preferred a different variant. So basically, reinforcement learning lets you not serve those 40% with something that they're going to be less likely to convert with. Reinforcement learning and FlowRL lets you serve that 40% the actual UI that they want to see. And that's really huge for the makers who spend and really waste so much time testing, mm-hmm. not getting their content seen, and it's just going to get better. It's going to be potentially a tool that we can really use to, to save some time and to help us make sure that the things that we're working on get seen, that they appeal to people because we are serving them with the things that they actually want to engage with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's a really good explanation of it. There's a ton of value in this. Really like the the discussion on the fact that A/B tests inherently leave out a segment of people when you choose which one to go with, being you know that forty percent. So yeah, it's going to be really exciting to see just how far this tech can go for that. Exactly. Yeah, and there was a lot to the conversation. So go and read the article. There are some things that. Fred and Alexi explained to me that, to be honest, we're still trying to sort through in terms of the technology and how they actually applied reinforcement learning as well as other machine learning concepts. So go ahead and take a look to understand a little bit more about how that works, uh, especially if you're a maker and it's something that you think could help your product. And yeah, I think there's going to be a lot more that we're going to see in this. When I was doing this research, I came across another startup in this space. They were funded with $25 million. Um, the, the headline was $25 million to kill A-B testing for marketing and machine learning personalization. And in the article, the VC investor was talking about how this technology seemed too good to be true. So again, this is really kind of an emerging space that a lot of people are still just learning about. So take a look. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely give that a read. Cool. So Aaron, tell us about the news. Yeah, cool. There was like a ton of headlines I could probably choose from last week, but I wanted to kind of give some love to Tesla fans. And um, you've been waiting a while for this. Um, so it's been a long wait since Tesla announced the Cybertruck back in 2019. And this week, we actually finally saw the first customers drive away in one. About time. Um, Elon announced the launch at their delivery day event. Um, it was an event laden with a lot of dubstep. It was a relatively short event, clocking in at around 30 minutes, and it was live streamed. I watched it myself, and I'll just give a rundown about everything I know after streaming it. Well, So, of course, the main thing is the truck. It comes in three separate configurations, all, of course, with three separate price points. So the first one starts at 60,990, and it comes with 250 miles of range and goes from 0 to 60 in 6.9 seconds. If you were hoping to jump onto the base model. Unfortunately, it won't be until 20, 2025. So if you want to buy now, you're going to have to shell out for the next two options, which are one, the all-wheel drive, which has a max range of about 340 miles and starts at just about $80,000. As the name suggests, this is an all-wheel drive. And now for my favorite. And I'd love to have like a drum roll for this. Oh, sure. But... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, hold on. So the third option is called the Cyber Beast. Oh, and this wow. name made me laugh so hard. I'm not like hating on Tesla. I'm not loving on Tesla here or Elon or anything. It's just this name. 
made me laugh so much. I had to like pause the live stream. It sounds to me a little bit like if you like let a five year old boy pick yeah. the name like Cyber Beast, which is which is cool at the same time. You know, that's like it's like Bodie McBoatface for anyone who remembers that. Yeah. It's hilarious and it works at the same time. Yeah, it reminds me of my days back when I was like six playing with Digimon characters. These ro- they were like robot dinosaurs. Or one one hundred percent call one a cyber beast at one point and go <laughs> definitely. Like, like I just keep imagining being like, "Oh, guys, you want to come back to my place? Then my cyber beast is just outside." <laughs> yes, spot on. But as the name suggests, kind of, I guess this is naturally like the highest spec and most expensive one. So it actually has less range than the middle option. It has a range of about three hundred twenty miles. You can expand that with some add-ons, apparently. It has three motors as opposed to one and two, I think. 845 horsepower, which, yeah, that's pretty intense. And starts at nearly 100k. 100k US dollars for this thing. Um, you know, if, if you want to do it, it's your money. More power to you and all that. Other things were announced, like a change from the stainless steel in the bed to a composite, um, which a lot of people didn't really seem super happy about, I don't think. Um, There was more details about the interior, including 18.5-inch Infinity touchscreen in the front and a 9.4-inch touchscreen in the back. But really, the biggest change was the price. Yeah, uh, I mean, six... 60k seems steep to start, but I'm I'm not a car person, so I don't know how this compares, but it does seem a little steep to start. Yeah, I mean, 60k in, on the the EV market, to me, over here anyway, it doesn't seem like a huge kind of thing. The main consideration is the price change for me. Back when this was announced, the base model started at 39,000. Um, now, to be fair, Elon did say last year that the prices will need to be changed, of course, to reflect the current ac- economy, probably some other things. But yeah, I did not expect like nearly a doubling in price. Right. But, yeah, I mean, it could be worth it to some people, probably will be worth it to a lot of people. Actually, I right. I have no doubt in my mind we'll see these things on the street soon. Right. Yeah, that's true. And the more we're going to see them, I saw... Alexis Ohanian shared a video on Instagram of him getting his Cybertruck and they did look pretty cool. So it it looked pretty futuristic. He said it felt like a really smooth drive. So um, that makes sense, too, in terms of the price reflecting the current economy. I mean, the prices of eggs are double. That applies (laughs) all the way up to the price of your Cybertruck as well. I, again, I'm I'm not a huge car person. They certainly look cool. I'm not sure it's how I would spend my hundred thousand dollars, but maybe other people would. Would you buy it? Probably not. I'm not a huge fan of Tesla cars. I don't really like the look of any of them. I'm just more of an old school kind of person when it comes to cars. I like Camaros. I like the old school Jeep Wranglers. But all in all, I'm more of a motorbike person. But it it kind of always reminded me of. The polygonal Lara Craft in PS1 on the PS1. I saw a meme comparing the two and it was actually, it was like the Tesla was almost looking in a mirror. Oh, wow. They had some kind of direct comparison going on between the really old school Lara Craft games and uh, this Cybertruck, but it's not for me, but I, I will be doing a double take when I see this thing finally hit the streets here. Right. Yeah, it's it's really an iconic look. I think it's so different than what we've seen before. It's super striking. And I what I would love is next time I'm taking an Uber, I would say probably in San Francisco because it's probably the first place I'll see it. Um, yeah. I would love, <laughs> That's usually how I end up riding around in a Tesla is when I get an Uber X and I'm happy to see that it's a, a Tesla. I get to to hang out in without buying one, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully soon enough, I'll get in the back of a, a cyber truck and check it out that way. Yeah, yeah, a, a cyber truck in San Francisco seems totally overkill, but I know it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, overkill. And again, it'll be an Uber driver, somebody who's like, "Oh, I'm going to pay off my cyber truck by driving on the side." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. It's like the bed will just be totally unused. It will never ever 
be used for what a truck bed is normally meant to be used for. <laughs> and you just see these things cruising around the street, maybe even driverless at some point. Yeah. Well, that's a really good point. It's it's like too pretty to be used as a truck, in my opinion. I mean, it's not like yeah. the stark contrast from an F-150 or anything like that. Yeah, there, there's two things about that. So one, like objectively, I do think it's like pretty in an ugly way, if that makes sense. It's designed to be striking and kind of weird, but in like a pretty nice kind of way, these sharp angles and stuff. So I do think it's like one, too pretty to be off-roading in like the countryside of Kansas or Texas or what have you. But also two, I think, I I don't know about America, but over here, if you went out to the back country with that, you're going to get laughed at by like the people that actually live and work out there and drive right. these for a living. Exactly. Yeah. I'd be super interested to see like the stats on on who the buyers are for these. But yeah. It's... I have some predictions in mind, but I'm going to keep my lips sealed. <laughs> okay. All right. Awesome. So should we move to the quick bites? Yeah, sounds good. So if you're a new listener, this section is where I give you a super quick rundown of some of the top headlines from last week and this week. So we're going to start with GTA 6. 10 years since GTA 5 launched and became this massive billion dollar phenomenon. The GTA 6 trailer dropped. And it dropped last night after being leaked early. And for any fans of like uh, GTA Vice City, we're back in Vice City uh, with some new protagonists. There's no word yet on like an expanded map. If you've been following along, people have been talking about a map of Liberty City, Vice City and San Andreas. No word yet on that, but this is only trailer one. So I'm sure there's some more surprises to come. Yeah, so I'm embarrassed to say here, I'm not a a big video gamer, at least not since my Sega Genesis and NES that I still have. Sega Genesis. (laughs) Love this. Yep, still have it. A handful of games. I can kick anyone's butt in Sonic on Sega Genesis. But I otherwise, I I haven't, other than watching people play, of course, don't know too much about Grand Theft Auto, but I was reading about this headline and saw, as you said, it's the second best-selling video game of all time after Minecraft with 190 million copies. So this was obviously a really big deal. And yeah, the, the fact that it's been 10 years since the video game came come out i was also reading about how it creates commentary like cultural commentary and that Mm -hmm. the last game that came out 10 years ago was sort of satirizing mark zuckerberg and facebook and this one is a lot more it shows a lot more of like live streaming instagram tiktok stuff so that was that was super fun i can see how yeah it's just going to be like super exciting and we still have to wait until 2025 um for it to come out so uh, that's a lot of anticipation there. Yeah, yeah. I was like 19 when this came out. I'm going to be like 31 when GTA 6 comes out or something. Wow. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not great at maths. But so, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to be in my 30s anyway. Yeah, yeah. That's a funny way to think about it. Right. A lot has changed. Yeah. So up next, Apple, in their long run, long running collaboration with Product Red, has released a new Product Red Apple Watch for sale. So it looks snazzy, it looks really cool. And if you didn't know, it goes to a really good cause. And that is to fund the HIV and AIDS research programs for cures, medicines, and what have you. Uh, Apple has a super long history doing this. I had the iPad Nano Red, the first generation iPad Nano Red, way back in the day. Love it. Yeah, brilliant. Super cool colorway. Yeah, to to be honest, I didn't know that they were still making product red products, but Mm. yeah. To to your point, I think that's, yeah, it was such a beautiful color in the like iPod, kind of iconic as well. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm glad to see that they're, they're doing this. Same, same. Yeah. Yeah. This might finally be the Apple Watch that I pick up. So we'd have to see. <laughs> um, and in TikTok news, Montana TikTok users, you can actually rejoice and scroll in peace because a judge has struck down a TikTok ban. So, yeah, whip out your iPhones, start recording, start dancing, doing whatever you want to do, or just doom scrolling. The law says you can do it now. I I didn't follow this news story specifically, but I know that there's constant drama around TikTok and privacy issues and security issues. And so I think it'll 
continue to be something we see pop up uh, for a while, but TikTok always scrapes out in the end. So happened again. Yeah, I think, I, I think I've seen like five threats in like the last year to ban TikTok nationwide over in the States. I don't really think it's ever going to happen, but yeah, they keep surviving. Awesome. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening in. As always, please share your feedback, thoughts. What did you like? What did you dislike? What do you want to hear more of? What kind of products are you interested in? What kind of news did we miss? We want to hear all of it. We appreciate you taking a listen. And until next time, once again, I'm Sarah Wright. I lead content over at Product Hunt. Aaron? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Echoing what Sarah said here. And I'm Aaron. I write newsletters for Product Hunt. And again, thanks so much for listening. Uh, looking forward to hearing your feedback. Great. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.